Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Trino. Uh, I think I already got a brief introduction, uh, but in addition to my like speaking and judging achievements, I thought I would just tell you just a tiny bit about why I'm telling you about Eastern Europe. So I am from Estonia. I have lived the majority of my life here. So technically, I just have personal experience within living in Eastern Europe. But also, since I am talking about the European Union and how the Eastern Europe generally interacts with it, I have also studied uh, EU law uh, for uh, for some time. So uh, I also like know the a bit of the legal perspective about that. So if you also have like any questions about that, I might be able to answer you from that perspective. Uh, and before we go into today's session, uh, I would just encourage everyone that if at any point you have any questions, type them in the chat or use the raise hand function on Zoom or basically, or also feel free to interrupt me if you want some clarification or if I'm speaking too fast or something is really confusing, confusing then chances are it's confusing for everyone. Uh, just interrupt me, stop me and tell me to go slower. With that out of the way, uh, I will today be talking mostly about Eastern Europe. A lot of the focus will be on how Eastern Europe interacts with the rest of the European Union, but there are some other aspects in there as well. Um, so the general structure that I'm going to follow, uh, or the broad like five strands that I will cover, is firstly giving you a bit of like general characterization about Eastern Europe and what to know in those types of debates. Secondly, tell you about the economic perspective. Thirdly, on the political and more stuff about like Euroscepticism. Uh, fourthly, I'll talk about national security and somehow uh, and like how Eastern Europe oftentimes interacts with Russia. And lastly, talk about the identity and identity formation and how that impacts different ways. Uh, under all of those sections, I will give some motion examples so you also like have a better understanding of what I talk about in relation to debating and how it oftentimes plays out in debates. Uh, so I try to keep it quite specific on that and not just giving a general lecture on what like Eastern Europe is like. So firstly, some general characterization. Uh, I think that the first important thing to know about Eastern Europe is that it's not a homogenous group. There are a bunch of different countries in there. Uh, I think that generally one of the things that there is to note about it is there is a lack of like cohesive uh, European Union or Eastern European identity that generally exists. That means that within the European Union, not all countries sh share the same ideology, not everyone considers themselves part of the European Union. There are different levels of identity, but even within Eastern Europe more specifically, for example, the groups of like uh, like the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania are quite different from, uh, I don't know, let's say Poland and Hungary or, or even the Balkan states, if, if you want to group them under Eastern Europe, uh, but also like Ukraine. At that point, I think it's just important to note that there are significant differences in that aspect. The second difference uh, that can be quite relevant in debate, or at least when you use examples, you need to be conscious of this, is that there are varying levels of membership to institutions like the European Union or, or NATO. That means, for example, well, most Eastern European states, or at least the ones I'm talking about, are parts of the European Union and part of NATO, for example, Ukraine, that is a prominent example, especially when you do comparisons with Russia, uh, then Ukraine is not a member of the EU nor NATO. I think especially with NATO, they have plans of joining, but that hasn't happened yet. So that's something that is important to keep in mind when you're characterizing um, the countries in the debates. Uh, thirdly, I think the countries have different relations to Russia. Uh, I will go more in depth about that uh, a bit later, but what this means is that generally some countries are more pro-Russian or have more pro-Russian governments, some countries are significantly more hostile towards Russia, and that is something that can also play into the way you characterize those states. Uh, lastly, there is a multitude of ethnicities and religions. Some countries, like for example the Baltics, or like Estonia and Latvia, are generally tend to be quite uh, atheist. There is no like strong adherence to religion, but the one that uh, the type of religion that like is actually quite most prominent is Russian Orthodoxy just because of the Russian minority and most of the like ethnic Estonians and La uh, Latvians are ones that are less religious. Uh, but I think also if you go down more to like Bulgaria, Romania, those types of countries, then Orthodoxy is something that is very prominent. So like um, especially in debates, like some motions exist on like uh, religions within Europe, uh, then there's quite important to understand that within Eastern Europe, there is a different relationships in those countries towards um, religion. However, uh, this doesn't mean that you are unable to generally make arguments about Eastern Europe together as a group. Uh, I think that there are quite a few things you can note that are very similar about them. 
I think that the first one is that they have somewhat similar economic history and standing. What this means is, especially if you compare it to like the rest of the European Union or generally Europe, these are countries that have been worse off, have the common Soviet history, uh, which means that this is something that uh, that has, for example, hindered their development or most post-communist or post-communist or post-Soviet states uh, are significantly less economically developed than countries that weren't uh, post-Soviet. So that is something that is relatively similar and is something that is you can use as a common feature when you're talking about Eastern Europe in uh, debates about like European economy, for example. The second thing is, is that most of those countries are uh, are proximate or like close to geographically to Russia. Uh, if not all of them, then most of them uh, are have like physical borders with Russia, which is something that is important in terms of like national security concerns, uh, but also having like, for example, ethnic Russian populations uh, or like minority groups within their countries, which is also important to like identity formation. And uh, lastly, I would just say that most of the Eastern European countries have similar position in regards to the uh, like European Union. I think that there is quite a visible and strong divide between Western and Eastern European countries. And to some extent, the concerns are similar, uh, which also makes this like presentation uh, a bit like more possible in that sense. I think generally when we're talking about um, Eastern Europe, especially in relation to the European Union, another important thing to note is that there is a difference in the real and perceived impact of the European Union. And I think that's something to keep in mind when you're making arguments. So for example, when you're talking about economic arguments, uh, then that is something that is a real and like tangible impact on Eastern European countries. You can see, like you can look at statistics, like how has being in the European Union helped uh, or disadvantaged, for example, Europe, uh, Estonia or Greece versus things like Euroscepticism or the subjective feeling of what like European Union is doing to you is something that is a lot more like perceived. It's kind of hard to like measure it in any types of ways, but both of them interact a lot in terms of the relationships these countries have with Eastern Europe, uh, with or Eastern Europe and European Union. Uh, to give a bit of like nuance to this and has to how to generally do it persuasively, I think that the first thing to do is use specific examples, uh, if at all possible. Uh, what I mean with this is that try to like find like examples from different Eastern European countries, like be like, oh, this is the way it is in the Baltics and this is the way it is in like, I don't know, Greece or Bulgaria. Uh, and even if like if necessary, I think it's quite easy to come up with plausible lies about Eastern Europe. I will probably give you some like tools or general characterization with which you can come up with those types of things. Uh, I think it's unlikely that you're going to go against so many people who are able to call you out that, that a specific thing you're telling is not the true case, because I think oftentimes just from the general characterization you have about Eastern Europe, it is quite easy to come up with like some specific uh, examples about it. Uh, second thing. Uh, is I think that it's good to find as many structural reasons applicable to all countries. Uh, that makes it quite easy to like be more convincing in terms of not just relying on examples, but rather having like uh, analysis that is consistent to all the European countries. Last thing uh, is that don't be afraid to call out spec knowledge or examples if you don't have it uh, from other teams. It might seem counterintuitive to the first point that I made about like using examples, but I think that if you're able to use examples well, by yourself, i.e., for example, bringing an example uh, or like bringing an illustration from different countries, that if someone just makes like a claim about Bulgaria, then that is something that is quite easy to take down, uh, especially at a point at which you can also like list different reasons, like the ones, for example, I gave in the previous slide as to why all of the countries in Eastern Europe are actually quite distinct, have distinct populations, have distinct economic histories. At that point, it's quite easy to just call out the spec knowledge, be like, look, it doesn't matter because in all of the other Eastern European countries, it's different, or it was only, or this example happened only this way due to a very specific, um, specific reason or specific anomaly, which doesn't exist in other Eastern European countries. So in that sense, like, even if you don't have the spec knowledge, even if you don't know lots about Eastern Europe, it's still possible to like call those things out or use examples yourself. But the best way to go forward is to always use structure analysis and like lots of reasons uh, that are that are quite consistent to all of those countries. Uh, is this uh, clear so far? Does anyone have any questions? Nope. OK, seems good. Uh, but if you do, just put them in the chat. Uh, the next thing is. Uh, I will give some like analysis in terms of the economic perspective. I think that this is the more of the 
real perception of the European Union uh, and Eastern Europe and how that interacts. The types of motions that oftentimes are covered under this or the, under which you can use this type of analysis is quite many. Uh, I think that it's quite common to have like motions about the European Union and it's like Eurozone or stuff like that. Um, and in all of those motions, it's quite easy to take the Eastern European lens and like make an extension out of it, for example. So motions such as, in hindsight, this house believes that the European Union should have never formed the Eurozone. Uh, oftentimes motions about like how to deal with crises, whether it's like the COVID crisis or the Greek uh, bailout deal, like the third motion is from the Athens EU, uh, EUDC open final, I think. Uh, so those types of motions uh, are ones that are quite common on this. Uh, the analysis to do here in terms of how uh, how Eastern Europe interacts with the rest of the EU or the general economic perspective uh, can go in both ways. Either on your one side, for example, the motion in hindsight, this house would have never formed the Eurozone. Then when you're on opposition, you have an incentive to characterize why Eastern European countries actually really benefit from the Eurozone or, for example, why they cannot manage without it versus on government side, you have the incentive to characterize the opposite saying like, look, Eurozone is really bad for those countries. So in the first slide here, I'm gonna tell you about how the need for an integrated market is something that is actually really like, I don't know, important for the Eastern European countries. I think that the first uh, thing to note here is that, or like the first piece of characterization to do in those types of motions is to give an understanding that Eastern European countries are unsuccessful on their own. Uh, it's quite easy to come up with structural reasons for this. I think that, uh, especially if you keep in mind, like which the countries are on the map, it's quite easy to do things like, look, they are, I don't know, uh, due to their geography, uh, they are small in size, thus they don't have like large populations. They can't have like lots of people on like many other, like internationally very successful economic, uh, e economically successful countries. They don't have large populations as workforce. Uh, their geography doesn't allow for things like, I don't know, resource uh, exploitation. They just don't have those types of things. Uh, the historic economic sectors that were propped up by the Soviet Union are ones that are, I don't know, obsolete in today's economy. You can also talk about just further generally about the historic perspective of what the Soviet Union did to the productivity and economy, like uh, just like statistically, most of the Eastern European countries after the fall of the Soviet Union uh, were just significantly economically worse off than the rest of Europe. Uh, and that is something that has significantly hindered the type of development they have had to they have had in the last 30 years. Uh, and that is just one type, one piece of like characterization you can give as to why it's unlikely that these countries would be super successful or economically well off without, for example, uh, having European Union by their side. Uh, the second thing is that they have a general lack of international bargaining power. Uh, what this means is that especially due to the reasons that you give in the first kind of point, or if you if you find other reasons, uh, these are countries that aren't generally like super valuable trade partners, i.e. if you wanted to make a separate deal with Germany, if you weren't part of the European Union, and you are a like tiny Latvia that doesn't have the most relevant industries that Germany itself already doesn't have in its own country, then Germany has no incentive of making good trade deals with you or making good plans with you just because your bargaining power is so weak. You also don't have like, I don't know, large militaristic or uh, you're not an important player in the NATO. At that point, like Germany has nothing to win from trading with you, or especially if you compare it to countries such as the US, uh, at that point, it's unlikely you're going to have good deals on your own as a small Eastern European country, uh, which means you're bad on your own. The alternative to that is Russia or turning to Russia because Russia will probably always have an interest in dealing with you. Uh, I think it's quite easy to characterize re reasons why Russia is a worse alternative, both economically, but also in terms of reliance. I will go a bit in depth uh, later on why Russia is the worst alternative, but like that's just a comparative you're able to do uh, like without the European Union and what those countries would be like. Uh, third, uh, common market gives reasons for West Western Europe to develop Eastern European markets. What this means is that like this is, uh, some of this is, probably overlaps with some like econ workshops you possibly have seen or you can watch on YouTube like reasons why like I don't know a common currency is good or bad I'm just trying to make it quite specific to Eastern Europe uh, but if you have a common European market that gives reasons for Western Europe to develop Eastern European markets i.e if you're reliant on the economy if you have a common currency within the European Union you're reliant also on Eastern European countries like not fucking up the economy or not making it significantly worse, not having crises there, then the incentive of countries like Germany and France, who are the main contributors to the European Union, they have an interest in developing, putting money in, having like uh, 
I don't know, like business equalizing policies within the European Union, which are things that just genuinely pump money to the Eastern European countries, make their markets better, develop infrastructure, all of that, that increases things like, I don't know, more businesses are willing to go into Eastern Europe, or you just generally uh, have better infrastructure or you have better econo a better economy because Western Europe has an incentive to develop you because you're shared in a common market and they want to get as much benefits out of it as possible without any of the like risk of prices. Uh, lastly, uh, a way you can frame this is that oftentimes like the, like, I don't know, the flip side of this case is that the other side goes like, oh, look, Eurozone is really bad because it makes you prone to crisis, stuff like that. Uh, you can say that you're, you as a country would be prone to crisis otherwise, uh, I, due to the reasons why your economy is so weak, you don't have like, I don't know, uh, market confidence, you don't have stability within your economy, your economy is quite new, so you don't have like a long historic, I don't know, reserve like the US has, uh, at that point you would be bad, uh, crises are likely to happen under your economy anyways, uh, independently of whether you're part of the EU or not, then the only difference that there is, is that at least if you're part of the European Union, then you're, when your currency is stabilized, don't have things like, I don't know, your mass inflation, uh, or you're able to rely on the European Union to want to bail you out due to basically the same reason as I gave you before, i.e. Germany doesn't want uh, countries like Estonia or Latvia to go under, uh, thus they're forced to give some type of aid. So especially if a crisis happens, you're better off. Uh, yeah, so I think that's the like positive reasons as to why having a common, like, I don't know, common currency or integrated market or even like uh, in motions where you have like a move towards a more integrated European Union. These are all of the reasons that you can use as well. You can be like, look, these are the things they have already benefited from. If you have even increased integration within the European Union, this is something that is really beneficial specifically for Eastern European countries due to those reasons. Uh, the flip side of this is that the integrated market is something that is harmful uh, and is bad, for, especially for Eastern European countries. Firstly, uh, the first thing under this is that you have different economics in Eastern Europe, you have different economic sectors uh, than to the ones who are decision makers within Europe. What this like uh, means essentially is that you have a wrong prioritization of economic policy. Uh, something that this requires, which I will probably explain a bit later, is that the European Union is like undemocratic or it's controlled by countries like Germany, Brussels, France, who are richer Western European countries. Their markets or their economies are structured around different things. So for example, if lots of Eastern Europe is focused on, I don't know, exporting some cheap goods or stuff like that, they would rather want the currency to be weak compared to if Germany is doing like lots of service or things like that, they're not uh, exporting as much, they're more like importing, they would want their own currency to be strong. At that point, you can already see the clashes in terms of the interest of the countries, especially if you're able to like co-op the analysis that like the other side does of like, look, they're so economic, economically bad off, they are nothing compared to Germany and France. You can be like, look, especially then they have a different idea uh, of what happened, uh, of what they want their economy to be. At a point at which you concede things like a common currency, you also lose some type of control over your monetary policy. At that point, it becomes kind of hard to control that and make the best economic decisions for your own country, um, especially then in Eastern Europe. The second thing under that uh, is also you, you're able to flip the government analysis on poor countries. Uh, and the way it manifests is basically like things like mass inflation. Uh, after most Eastern European countries joined the Eurozone, there was a very strong inflation in all of those countries. Uh, in the Baltic states, which are generally economically more developed than uh, more like Southern Eastern states, like I don't know, Romania or Greece, uh, the inflation has like worn off, the countries have gotten more economically well off. Uh, but for example, still in Greece, obviously they had the, uh, the economic crisis just recently, but despite that, uh, they still, the inflation is something that the average Greek person is still able to feel and they're able to remember it. So that is something that is actually a tangible harm of joining the Eurozone just because your currency previously was so much weaker than the Euro uh, and to join the Eurozone, uh, you had to have some type of mass inflation. Uh, the other thing is just generally our economies are unable to adjust. This also means things like uh, with like free movement of people, you have things like brain drain or it's quite easy uh, for people to move around or you have other like uh, cheap labor coming into your country. At that point, oftentimes the economic sectors are unable to adjust to those uh, types of structural changes that the common market brings along. Uh, and if you already have a weak Eastern European economy that isn't like well structured or has problems already, then that is something that is a start of a crisis basically. 
another thing to note is that Eastern European countries have different levels of taxation to those of the Western European ones, or even like Northern Europeans one like, uh, like Finland and uh, Sweden. But uh, this is this is an important piece of characterization, especially in debates that are like, um, like the recent uh, uh, Euro's final was, uh, this house supports a multi-speed Europe. Uh, I think at a point at which you know that Western European states have a lot higher taxation than most Eastern European states, then probably the consensus on having good cohesive economic policy or moving towards um, a European Union that has, for example, common taxation is something that is unlikely to happen because Eastern European taxation policies are generally a lot lower. They're unwilling to do high taxation uh, at that point, that again shows like a difference in the economies and a difference on what, for example, that can also be reflected in European Union policy, uh, just generally like you, for example, prescribe some policies that would require high taxes in order for you, that policy to be possible in many Eastern European countries, just because you don't have the high taxation, you're genuinely just unable to do that type of policy and you're hurt by the EU and they're putting fines on you for not complying with them, another harm of that. Uh, third reason, uh, and I think that that is the one that is probably used the most often, or it's quite visible, uh, is that in Eastern Europe, after joining the Eurozone, there was a high chance of crisis, or, or you can quite like overplay that on how, how that is very likely. I think that the uh, obvious example of that is the, uh, the Greece crisis uh, that happened after the 2008 crisis uh, by the most by far uh, in Europe, or also like generally in among all developed countries. Uh, the most of the or like the most obvious reason for that as to why it happened is because Greece had joined the eurozone. Uh, they were sharing a common currency. They didn't have control over that currency, so then which meant that they cannot use monetary or fiscal policy to actually meaningfully stimulate the economy, get out of a crisis. What this means is that they just had a massive recession uh, just because they were part of this and they were unable to deal with the fact that a crisis had hit their country. Uh, and I think that's quite a easy example to play to because the devastation of that was quite big it's still lasting you can still see it in Greece uh, and at that point the common currency especially if you like I don't know co-opt gov saying like ah oh, crisis happened on either side then you can just use this and be like look you're just unable to get out of crisis if you have common currency because no one else is willing to for example uh, inflate the crisis or have higher interest rates or stuff like that uh, and in all of that like I think these are just reasons for generic uh, or like for generally for Eastern Europe and how that interacts. But obviously in those types of debates, you would probably also need some like more econ specs. So you can go watch some other uh, econ workshops on how to do other like common currency arguments, uh, which are also relevant, but this is just the Eastern European perspective on it. The way to make it impactful or how to play up the role of Eastern Europe in debates, because sometimes it might be like, no, but the general economic level of Europe is more important. Uh, and these are a couple of uh, ways in which you can weigh these arguments. I think that the first thing is just like characterizing economic vulnerability of Eastern European countries. You can do this by, for example, com like trying to do like a anecdotal comparison of the day-to-day -day life of Eastern Europeans versus like Germans or whatever, or the more well-off uh, Western European countries that you choose. Um, and I think through that, it's quite easy to play that these are just the most economically worse of countries. And at that point, that is something uh, that you need to protect the most vulnerable group where their economic growth is the most important. The cha marginal change in economy for the average German just doesn't manifest in their lives meaningfully enough to be important. The second thing you can talk about is that the economy is also something that impacts Euroscepticism. The way this does is that the real impact of the European Union uh, on Eastern European countries, their economies and their markets is something that does actually matter a lot in creating the narratives about um, how people interact with the European Union. What this means is that like, if you are able to see that European Union made your country so much richer, like oftentimes is the case in mo most of the Baltic states, then you're probably much more likely to have a good relation with the EU, or have a good opinion of the EU, and your skepticism is less likely in your country. However, in countries like Greece, where you're still feeling the after effects of the crisis, and you quite clearly know that it was reason because you were part of the Eurozone, it is a lot more likely that you're very hostile towards European Union just because the economic policy mattered the most. Given that the European Union is primarily an economic union, this is something that does matter quite a lot into the Euro skepticism uh, debates and arguments as well that you might have. A uh, third thing you're able to do is impact it to Russia. Uh, what this means is that if Eastern European countries are more connected to the European Union, uh, most of their trade goes with 
Western Europe rather than going to Russia, that means that it's something that makes them a lot less reliant on Russia in terms of trading with them, uh, but also it empowers the Putin regime less if Putin just cannot trade with Eastern Europe because Eastern European countries are rather uh, trading with uh, uh, trading with Europe. Uh, sorry, Tavian, uh, I'm a bit unsure about the real impact of EU on E. Ah, okay, sorry, I'm just using like uh, abbreviations. Uh, what this means is that like the it's not the economic impact is not just about like the fluffy feeling of like ah oh, what does European Union mean for me I'm able to travel freely within the European Union but it's something you can like quite hard in statistics see that like look joining the European Union made Estonia a lot uh, better off in terms of uh, economies it opened lots of markets uh, up to us we gained even if we had inflation in the beginning then later on our markets adjusted and having European subsidies just for example uh, agricultural subsidies is the thing that pays for lots of the development that happens within Estonia um, the comparative then is that like if you're a country that is like economically worse off within the European Union i.e all of the countries that you can characterize using the negative characterization I provided on the last slide or countries like Greece uh, at that point the real impact or like the the impact that you can see in statistics uh, if it is bad on your country I like Greece went through a massive crisis then that is something that just is very harmful uh, to the narratives those Eastern European countries have uh, about European Union. Does that clarify it a bit? Uh, tell me if it's uh, still unclear. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and last point uh, to EU cohesion uh, is that if you have a strong economy uh, and most of the countries in EU are benefiting from having, for example, a good common currency or common market or stuff like that, uh, then that is also something that creates the, the grounds to actually start further cooperation within Europe to do things like move towards, I don't know, a common taxation policy, uh, which can obviously separately economically be impacted by that might be a good or bad thing. Uh, but just generally, if you have a good grounds in Europe that like Eastern European countries are economically well off, whether it's within the integrated market or not, then you can say that that is something that enables further like political collaboration and you can impact it to lots of different things, whether economically or like liberalization, stuff like that. Um, I hope that this is clear. If you have any more questions, pop them in the chat or anywhere else. Oops, I already went to the next slide, but uh, if you still have questions, feel free to interrupt. Uh, so beyond the economic stuff, and I feel like I already foreshadowed it a bit by talking about things like Euroscepticism, uh, I think the political perspective of Eastern Europe and generally European Union um, is prominent in basically literally any motion that you ever have about Europe, that you have oftentimes about like Russia and uh, the United States and involvement in the EU and all of that. Uh, yes, uh, I will go to Euroscepticism uh, in the next slide and like explain all of that about it. Uh, but basically just to give a definition Euroscepticism, what it means uh, is that it's like a political trend within Europe where people are skeptical or critical about the European Union or uh, especially of the membership of being or like being a member of the European Union. Uh, what this the biggest manifestation of this is obviously Brexit where the UK was so Eurosceptic or so critical of the European Union that they decided to leave the European Union uh, but often this also just manifests in for example like populist parties within Eastern Europe uh, or in countries like Poland and Hungary uh, or I don't know political parties like I think the Golden Dawn in Greece are like very openly uh, Eurosceptic parties uh, so that's that but I will explain how all of that happens on the next slide. Uh, the political perspective is important in motions that basically any motion that ever covers stuff like uh, we're we're supposed to change the structure of the European Union in, in some types of ways, like whether we're changing the voting system, the democratic representation, how the uh, European Parliament works, all stuff about that, but also things like more specific policy motions that you have, i.e. this House believes that the European Union should suspend the membership of Hungary and Poland, uh, probably on the grounds that they're being like a liberal also in that sense like any type of policy the European Union takes uh, in all of those motions you can think like what is the link between euro skepticism and uh, and the specific policy at hand um, 
So the basics of Euroscepticism, I'm going to give you like three or four layers of how Euroscepticism most often like manifests or where it comes from or what it is based on. Oftentimes you are able to use all three or four of them, but sometimes just depending on the motion, uh, it is a lot more concentrated onto one thing. Like I, if you have a debate about uh, like national security concerns or stuff like that, then in those instances, probably the reasons about national security are more important than the economic ones. But I'll go through it and hopefully it all makes sense. So the first category uh, that Euroscepticism is oftentimes based on is things like national identity and sovereignty. Uh, the way this like manifests or generally is, is that a lot of European Union is associated with things like a liberal policy or, or, or like forced liberalization, forced ideas being put onto you that, that, that you don't retain control over as a country because you're giving control away to Brussels or giving away control to the European Union. I think the biggest manifestation of that was the refugee crisis in 2015, I think, uh, in which lots of the refugees that came to Europe from the Syrian civil war were distributed among it and uh, among European states and especially in Eastern Europe a lot of the countries had a very heavy opposition to having any refugees enter their country on grounds of things like national identity or wanting to, I don't know, maintain their nation state. Um, and then that was something that was uh, like in the years like 2016 and 17, where the like, I think heights of Euroscepticism also like around the time when Brexit happened um, is the reaction of political parties to the fact that Europe forced something onto them or like forced some type of liberalization or acceptance of refugees, things like that onto those countries. And that is something that they do not want. And that creates an idea of like, oh, we're anti-Europe because of this. Another aspect of this is the general national security or like foreign policy con concerns, especially in relation to Russia. Like if Eastern European countries that are oftentimes very afraid for their national security when they're next to Russia, uh, then at that point, if they feel like the European Union is not holding a strong enough line, for example, against, Europe, uh, against Russia, then oftentimes that's another grounds for like their national identity is being harmed by the European Union because they're not cared enough about or their personal identity is not cared enough about. So that's the way like the national identity part manifests. Uh, oh, and last thing under this is that there is also from the like good old Soviet times, there is a historic anti-Western sentiment in lots of the older people who generally just have like something that was a, a lot propagated by the Soviet Union was that like the West is bad, all of that, but also people who have been harmed uh, by some type of Western not necessarily intervention. I think that's more something that's a lot more prominent, for example, in the Balkan countries, uh, but just generally the West and its economic models and all of that, or people who lost out after the end of communism because of the rise of capitalism, uh, then these are the people who also have like historic anti-Western sentiment that is also like, uh, like played onto by politicians. Uh, the second area in which Euroscepticism emerges or how it is quite prominent uh, is economic. Most of this I already basically covered under the economics point, but the way politicians tend to do it is that they do things like they are showing the crisis and the inflation that has happened uh, after joining the European Union. It's quite easy, even in like the, uh, the Baltic states, like in Estonia and Latvia, you can politicians use the example of the Greek uh, Eurozone crisis as like an example as to why the European Union membership is a bad thing and how it can be economically very detrimental to you. Uh, the second thing is the economic differences between West and uh, East. That's the stuff I also talked about in terms of like how you have different understandings, the way like it manifests within politics is being like, look, Germany is rich and developed. We are not, we can't agree on the policies that they do. Uh, oftentimes also when you have like new policies uh, trying to, like the European Union is trying to pass new policies. Uh, for example, they had one about like quite recently about like transportation and how like truck drivers are supposed to do like very specific regulations about that that was just very good for like germany and countries like that uh because just generally of their transport industry but it 
to a very large extent would have fucked over the transportation industry of like uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland because all of them have like long transit routes when they're trying to do exporting. Um, at that point, that was like another example of how the economic differences just based on the sectors created a policy that was really detrimental to Eastern Europe. Uh, and that again, fueled all of the anti-European politicians to be like, oh, look how the bad EU is doing such bad economic policy. Um, so that's another way it manifests. Uh, lastly, I think that Euroscepticism, I think a nuance to understand is Euroscepticism isn't inherently a right-wing issue. Uh, some more leftist parties are oftentimes also critical of the European Union, uh, and that is something to keep in mind. Uh, so more leftist parties or more like socialist parties oftentimes blame the European Union for being too neoliberal or like having policies that are too much in support of like uh, privatization, authority, stuff like that, that are very like neoliberal economic values. And then like leftist parties criticize the European Union on those grounds. Whereas more right-wing parties uh, or economically right parties criticize the European Union for being too socialist or like, I don't know, adhering too much to like the Nordic standards of welfare countries, forcing those types of regulations on us that we want to be more economically right-wing. Uh, so different justifications are used by different ends of the spectrum uh, to justify like economic opposition to membership of the European Union. Uh, the Oh, and last thing is that oftentimes the EU benefits that you get, i.e. like, I don't know, subsidies or the European Union just spends a lot of, lot of money on developing Eastern European countries. That's just something that's not visible to people. People don't know that these are things built by the European Union, possibly something that could fix, be fixed with like better campaigning or stuff like that. Uh, but generally, that's the way uh, people feel about the European Union. They don't understand what it's good. This is especially true if you're more like a working class person who doesn't live in like capitals of all of those uh, of all of those Eastern European countries. Those subsidies aren't reaching you, but they're relatively reaching more like economically developed areas because the European Union wants to prioritize them. Especially at that point, it becomes a lot harder to um, to support or see the benefit you get from it. Uh, again, also if you're like a person that is more like living in your own country and you don't benefit from things like the free movement of people uh, or the free movement of labor just because it's irrelevant to you or irrelevant to your personal circumstances then again you don't see the benefits and you don't understand why the eu is something that is good and at the point at which politicians play up all of those other things it becomes easy to buy into that the next thing is that uh is the institutional slash democratic lens what this means is that Oftentimes, there is a high belief that smaller countries uh, are far away from Brussels. Brussels, uh, so that's where the European Parliament and like all of the European Union's decision making happens, uh, is the one that controls all of the decisions that are getting made. And smaller countries don't really have any power uh, over, like they don't have any power over the decision making that European Union does. The way this happens is like, if you look at the composition of European Parliament, it is based on proportional representation, which means that countries with a large population, i.e. Germany, have like, I think, 96 seats there in the parliament versus Estonia that has one of the smallest populations in Europe has six seats, which is the minimum number of seats you're ever able to have within uh, the European Union, uh, European parliament. What that means is that it creates like a idea that uh, you are unable as a small country to effectively mobilize against the bigger ones who have so much representation within those parliaments uh, or also in the other institutions of the European Union, even the ones where you have like one head of state representative, the European Council, uh, in there due to the fact that there's kind of like an effective veto, you feel like oh, all of the Western countries are vetoing things that the Eastern countries care about. So that's something that like institutional slash democratic lens of how Euroscepticism also happens to play onto the idea that we have no control over this, our sovereignty, our democracy is taken away. Oftentimes it's like right wing parties, they're also like supporters of like, I don't know, direct democracy or stuff like that. Uh, that is something that is quite a clear uh, harm. The next thing is a lack of EU cohesion, which means that there is generally like no common identity. You, th you see things like the European uh, Union sanctioning its own members or at least wanting to sanction its own members for like seemingly choosing democratic things, uh, i.e. like Hungary and Poland having like more authoritarian countries, uh, meddling with the courts and their independence, having no media freedom, stuff like that. Um, 
at, at a point at which you see the European Union stifling the independence uh, and like sovereignty of countries uh, proximate to you, choosing things for themselves. At that point, it becomes quite hard to, to support this and be like, oh, why do I need to support an institution that's willing to suppress me and my democratic choices? Uh, lastly, how politicians and parties generally use it is that uh, Eurosceptic politicians or ones that are critical of the European Union uh, use this as a lens to differentiate from other parties to capture new voter groups. For example, they're able to do things like show a clear stance regarding the European Union. You're able to be like, look, we're very critical of it. We want out. That is something that is a very clear slogan that you're able to do. When you have more like centrist parties or parties that are like kind of pro-EU, oftentimes um, like there are lots of things to criticize the EU for, so none of them are openly like, yes, the EU is the best thing ever. Like oftentimes the political parties just aren't like that in your Eastern Europe, uh, but they're rather like, they just uh, like quietly support the European Union. Uh, then it becomes quite easy for all of those like more right-wing or more populist parties to be like, look, you're too lenient to the European Union. You give them all they want. Uh, you don't have any kind of stance on it. And that's an easy way you're used to like differentiate it. Last way it is done is that the stuff I talked about earlier, that you have both left wing and right wing parties who are anti EU, uh, oftentimes, even though their policies have literally nothing in common, like they want completely, totally different economic policies. Uh, then when they collaborate with other uh, anti EU parties across the spectrum, they're able to get more clout and like more political support and possibly even like get to governance, for example. And that's a clear way some parties in Europe have collaborated um, with each other. So these are basically the ways in which Euroscepticism manifests. Um, most parties or politicians who like, like Viktor Orban that you can see here in the picture, most of them uh, are use all of the like four different types of tactics of like talking about national identity. They talk about the economic aspect. They talk about the institutional or like democratic aspect and they talk about the cohesion. But when you're doing like debates about it, uh, then you might just be better off like picking one or two things. Like when you have an economic debate, you can do all of the stocky econ stuff that I mentioned earlier, and you can do the like stuff as to how uh, economics uh, and the institutional stuff, for example, matters most to your skepticism, how then like it increases or decreases. Uh, how do you then uh, impact this or why is your skepticism so bad? Uh, the first thing is that there is a change in EU policymaking if there is a high prominence of uh, Euroscepticism. Well, what this means is that because members of European Parliament are directly uh, elected and uh, like represent the views of people, if you have Eurosceptic members of members of European Parliament uh, within like your policymaking, then they're the ones that are sabotaging policies, often resulting in the fact that some like good EU initiatives just don't get passed uh, because you have politicians that are against it. Or if they do get passed, they're oftentimes like watered down uh, to stuff of like, if you, for example, if you want to do like a good environmental initiative, but you have people who don't want to give more mandates or stuff like that to the European Union to do legislative like reasoning over the other countries, uh, then if you have lots of like Eurosceptics there, uh, then it's very likely that you're just reducing the type of impact all of those possibly good EU policies are able to have. Naturally, if you're using this to impact, you also probably need to explain why all of those EU policies are likely going to be good things to have, or why on the comparative they would be better if they weren't watered down or if they would exist, but that's a way like it essentially manifests. The second way it manifests is that having an opposition to EU within like political parties or like for example, the Estonian Conservative Party, if it's super opposed to the European Union, oftentimes they also, to carry their point more strongly, they're opposed to the values that the European Union carries because they're like, look, we're standing for a nation state. We don't want to force liberalization onto us. And then they're also against more liberal values or more liberal and progressive politics in their own countries. Uh, and oftentimes for those reasons that are a lot more conservative and people prop them up in, in sense of like, they believe like, ah, if I don't like the European Union, I also have to be against this type of thing and people buy into that. Uh, and at that point, uh, like you have less progressive or like liberal policies and you can impact to that, like how it's harmful for like vulnerable groups and stuff like that. Thirdly, there is an increased turning to Russia. Uh, if you are very anti-EU, this is something that's quite uh, evident in countries like Hungary, where they are quite opposed to uh, EU and its power and then someone to deal with EU is sanctioning them so they're just not on good terms. At that point, they're oftentimes turning to support for 
uh, towards Russia or trading with them or getting like, I don't know, having close meetings with them. Why this isn't essentially a bad thing is that one, it gives like support to the Putin's regime, which I think is quite easy to impact or like make it important as to why that might be a bad thing. Secondly, uh, if countries become more reliant on Russia, it actually like, uh, like reduces the sovereignty they themselves have at a point at which you have promised things to Putin or you have a close cooperation, it becomes very hard to do things that would anger Russia uh, or be against Russian interests. So countries actually just lose out on sovereignty to choose the best policies for themselves, uh, even if like being Eurosceptic would be in the interest of people, if, if that's something like your opposition could, could claim. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just generally having increasing deals with Russia oftentimes increases authoritarianism in those countries, especially as Putin has an interest to keep things like stability and uh, know who's always in power. Putin oftentimes does props up things like supporting meddling with the courts or being anti-democratic, doing all of those things. Again, quite easy to impact as to why that might be a bad thing. Uh, I hope that's uh, all clear. Now, after all of those reasons as to how Euroscepticism happens, uh, why this is likely to happen, here are a couple of things on how you're able to mitigate it. So the first thing you can do uh, is that you can explain how EU institutions are in fact democratic, especially if you have like, like Central European judges, they're going to be big fans of you if you characterize all of like Germany nicely. Uh, but the way to do it is that um, like a couple of just facts, I guess, about the European Union under here to throw in is that like one, you have proportional representation within the European Parliament. Uh, that is something that just generally gives uh, gives grants for like Eastern European countries to actually be democratically represented. On principle, they do have control over it. Uh, that is proportional to them. The second thing under that is that even if all of the small countries have like six each, uh, six seats each, and Germany has like ninety six, then if all of the Eastern European countries, given that you probably also characterize that they have broadly similar interests, if they come together and vote against a policy, then they do have more power than even the Germany with lots of seats in there, because all of those countries together have a higher population or stuff like that. So you're able to have like collaboration on those types of issues, even within the European Parliament, that seems kind of undemocratic because Germany has so many seats. Secondly, in the European Council, which is an institution that is basically comprised of all of like one head of state from each country, from each European Union member state country, uh, there oftentimes they come, to, or like most often they come to decisions uh, unanimously or they try to pass uh, like motions or decisions that everyone agrees to so effectively if one person or one head of state is like no no I'm not agreeing to this then you technically have an effective veto over it which I think is quite a powerful tool in terms of overcoming the fact that uh, there is no democratic uh, control over it the legislation generally goes through three uh, institutions so there are lots of checks and balances within the European Union that everyone gets a say in this uh, and lastly, the treaties governing EU provide the mandates based on which the European Union is able to legislate. So if you don't know anything about EU, uh, then I think that the easiest way to explain this is that the EU doesn't have a mandate or isn't allowed to legislate over absolutely everything. For example, they're not allowed to legislate over like, I don't know, uh, health policy that happens in a specific country or like specific national security concerns, because it just isn't into the treaties that govern the European Union. It's just not written into there. Um, at that point, you have very clear limitations on the European Union power. If they exceed those powers, they you can take them to court. Uh, and the way to make this like understand that people have like consented to this is that in most Eastern European countries, when you entered the European Union, you had a national referendum on whether you want to be part of this institution or not. At that point, you were already aware of what are the mandates that the European Union has control over. In that sense, like what is the democratic power that you're giving away to the European Union? At that point, once you have like consented into that through the national referendum, uh, then you, it's quite easy also to go like people actually do have democratic control over it. They have consented into this type of system. The next thing is that uh, the European Union does have lots of visible benefits. That's why if anyone like ever tries to make an argument about like, ah, uh, Euroscepticism means that we're going to have five more Brexits and like Poland and Hungary are going to uh, are going to leave, uh, then uh, then in that case, uh, I will answer the question in a second. Then in that case, you want to do things like talk about the visible benefits uh, of the European Union. Uh, I will, I will go through this point and then I'll respond to the questions. So the visible benefits of things are like uh, economic subsidies, uh, agricultural ones are most common or most seen. 
uh, things like development funds, European Union has lots of them. They have like very specific Eastern European ones to very specific countries. They have lots of policies on that and they are actually relatively visible and people know when like, if you ever walk around Europe and in like some cities and places, you actually do see like plaques with like, ah, oh, this is, uh, this is built by using European money and stuff like that. So that's something that is visible. Uh, uh, then you have obviously things like the free movement of people, which means that I'm able to visit every single country in Europe, visa free. No one is going to basically ask for my passport on any of the border controls. It's just super easy and people have gotten used to it. And it's really nice to like travel around Europe in that sense, which is a clear benefit that people just see and feel on, their, on themselves. Also people generally tend to have a status quo bias. Um, which means that people are already so used to the European Union. So it is just unlikely that in any countries, uh, people are going to be so opposed to the European Union that they would actually, I don't know, consider quitting uh, or consider leaving. And that's why like Euroscepticism has limited support or like oftentimes like the political parties that support it, they're generally like not more than like 20% in most of the countries, but probably higher in some others. Uh, lastly, uh, or maybe not lastly, thirdly, uh, the Brexit process that has been going through and uh, people see it as something that is harmful. It's a long process. Britain is economically losing a lot from it. So people, it's quite a good visible example of how leaving the European Union is really bad, even if you were a country that was contributing more that was gaining. So which was the status of uh, the United Kingdom within the European Union uh, before they left. Uh, even if you're a country like that, uh, it's just quite visible that even for powerful countries, leaving the European Union is something that is just genuinely detrimental for its economy. Uh, so people aren't supporting it as much. Euroscepticism actually has gone down in the past like year or two. Uh, lastly, uh, another way to mitigate Euroscepticism is basically to go like, look, if some Euroscepticism exists within the European Union, uh, it does represent the view of some people in it. Some people do not think that they're getting any benefits from it. The main thing that it's doing is that it forces the European Union to be more democratic, more transparent about what it's doing and where the money is going, how the legisl legislative process is working. Uh, it is a, like, to some extent, it's a fine thing to exist within the European Union because you have already previously mitigated that it's probably not going to cause another Brexit. So like, what's the worst that can happen basically from it? Uh, I hope. Oh, uh, I hope that that is clear. Uh, I will uh, now respond to all of the questions. Firstly, what is status quo bias? Uh, that's the like bias towards the existing state of affairs. So I, if everyone is really used to living in the European Union, uh, you're biased towards the way life has been in your past like 10 years. You just like the state of affairs like it is right now. Uh, so you're unlikely to actually want to change anything about it because it just kind of feels nice. Uh, it's the way I would explain it. I, I hope that's clear. Uh, could you elaborate the 1C uh, point one more time? Oh yeah, so legislation through three institutions. Uh, what this means is that um, the it's quite like detailed European legislative procedure. It's called ordinary legislative procedure if anyone ever wants to Google it. Uh, but what this means is basically in order for a new policy or a new directive or new legislation to get passed from the European Union, first it starts from the European Commission, which is a like a European democratic body that is elected or comprised of like a certain group of people like has also like country representatives and stuff like that. They're the ones who initiate the legislation. Then it goes to like the European Parliament where you have the democratic representation. Then it goes back and forth basically between the European Council, I think, uh, in which you have the heads of the states who are like talking through things. So because it goes through three different institutions and each of the institutions have different ways in which they democratically represent uh, or more or less democratically represent the member states or like, for example, the politicians in the member states, uh, then in that case, you just have like three separate institutions, in which case uh, the democratic problem isn't, isn't has, as high because countries have quite a few places in which they can like go against the type of policy. So for example, if you're Estonia uh, and if you're very vocal in all three of those institutions, you're like, no, 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 we're not supporting this, then it's very unlikely that that legislation gets passed. So it's just an additional check and balance. I hope that makes it clear. Uh, how EU cohesion is problematic. Uh, can you uh, explain on the last question, could you please elaborate a little on how the EU cohesion is problematic? I think that's like the stuff I had on the... 
Wait, sorry, I'm gonna go to the last slide. Uh, sorry, it's hard. So I think that the stuff about EU cohesion, um, what you might mean uh, is that the fact that there is no common European identity and the, is, is that what you mean? And like the fact that they're sanctioning on countries like, uh, like Poland, Hungary, is that the question? Um, is it okay if I unmute? Yeah, 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 sure. Cool. So when we were talking about impacts, there were four things that we talked about. Primarily the characterization of economic vulnerability, then the impact to Euroscepticism, the impact to Russia, and the last point was that of cohesion and how that is largely problematic for the regions. I just needed a, layer, a little clarity on how uh, cohesion was actually being talked about, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll go back to that slide. Ah, okay. So the thing uh, of this, oh, okay, okay. So the point of this is, it's quite a far-fetched impact, I would say. So I think that just generally the first three are a lot more important. But what this means is that if you have a, um, the economies of the independent European countries work well, and that which means that you have people who are quite in support of the stuff that the European Union is doing because they can feel that the European Union is economically benefiting them, then you have a higher likelihood that those people are also in favor of new policies that the European Union would pass that increase economic cooperation, i.e. they have, I don't know, you're in favor of more regulations for the internal market, um, which would make, I don't know, trading easier, would create more um, economic development in most of the countries if you have a very like similar like similar rules across all of the economic markets, or your countries are more prone to agree to stuff like uh, having a common taxation policy in the future, which is something that like it is kind of discussed within Europe. Um, so basically the point of this analysis is, uh, is to go like, look, if everyone is happy with the way the European uh, economy is, then you have more support for like, stronger European identity, stronger European integration. And if you're able to impact as to why that might be a good thing in terms of like economic well-being, then that's a, uh, then that's another impact you're able to claim from that. Uh, does that make sense? Yep, yeah, thanks a lot. Good, I'm trying to see if there was another question. How to frame Russia's role in favor of Eastern Europe? Uh, I will, um, there are, I think the next thing actually now is going to be like national security and all of that. So I will respond to that question under that, uh, I think. So if you have no more questions up until this point, I think I am going to move on to that. I'm gonna put it to present again, so it looks all nice. Okay. Oh. Uh, Okay, so I think up until here, uh, I finished talking. So that's the way you're able to like mitigate the stuff about Euroscepticism. I hope that political stuff is like relatively clear. If not, ask me more questions uh, now or in the end. So the next thing uh, is national security and how that interacts. Uh, I think that the national security thing has lots of different motions tied to it. I think. Um, it covers the most ground that is not just very super specific European Union motions. So that's stuff like the US and Russia relations or European Union and Russia relations. One of the recent ones I did was like, the Biden administration should adopt a diplomatic rather than antagonistic approach to Russia um, or like generally emotions about the NATO, but also more like economic motions. Uh, this was another motion at the EU DC that just happened. This house regrets Germany's decision to go ahead with the Nord Stream 2 deal with Russia um, I will give you an example, like more specifically how that interacts with national security. But these are the types of motions in which this analysis can be can be very useful. Uh, so first thing under national security is that I think oftentimes um, what happens in debates when you have like, ah, should the US care more about it or should the EU care more about uh, the Russian interference in Eastern Europe or stuff like that. The oftentimes when you're the side that is trying to prove that look like conflict is a problem or Eastern European is 
in a large, they're like very much afraid for their sense of security and being proximate to Russia, then oftentimes the responses you get to that are like, oh, it's actually not important. Russia in no way is going to invade uh, the, Baltic st- uh, the Baltic states. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, in that case, I think what is important to do is give structural reasons as to why it is actually an important and urgent issue that needs to be talked about and uh, how like later on it can be impacted to other things as well. So the first thing is that uh, is the perspective of like Eastern European countries, why it is something that is a relevant issue to them. Uh, Firstly, it's obviously history. Most Eastern European states have been under Russian rule for like the majority of their history, but obviously most notably under the Soviet Union just last century. That is something that people remember. Uh, And given that the history is often just very, very hostile, i.e. lots of like family members and like uh, were like killed, you had purchased stuff like that. The general economic situation was really bad. People are just afraid of Russian rule in general in Eastern European countries. And that's like the historic perspective. The second thing is, is that national security just generally is constantly played out, uh, played up in Eastern European politics. I.e. when I go to elections every four years in Estonia, like national, like, government elections, then every time one of the like more important questions that just pops out around election time is like how much a certain party wants to fund our national security, wants to fund our military, wants to fund conscription, stuff like that. Uh, and that is just precisely because that is it is such an important and contentious issue within national politics that everyone wants to talk about because they have the personal connection of like, ah, oh, we're close to Russia. Um, and it's just played up a lot in politics. And it seems like an easy way. You can get easy wins in politics if you're like, look, we're supporting national security. We're increasing our military budget from like 2% to 2.5%. Um, and that's the way that it's like done. And it's constantly on the minds of people. Uh, what that means is that, especially because you, all of those countries have ge- geographic proximity to Russia, most of them share a very long border with Russia. It's just an issue that like seems important and urgent to them. Um, and the last aspect of this is that all of the Eastern European countries know that they're reliant on external actors in case Russia ever decides to invade them, which means that like all of the countries are small uh, on their own their military power is tiny and especially like basically like any individual European country's military power is tiny compared to the one of Russia uh, because it's just so huge and so much money is being poured into the Russian military. That means that all of those countries are never able to go against Russia on their own. Like if Russia decided to invade like it did in Ukraine, then obviously on their own, these countries are going to fall. What this means is all of those countries are reliant on external actors such as the European Union supporting them like economically or the NATO most importantly, uh, militarily supporting them because like, for example, through NATO article five, the United States has pledged that like if like Estonia gets attacked by Russia, then US is going to send its forces. Uh, and this is something that is very prominent. You also see like NATO forces being present in Baltic states uh, or generally Eastern European countries. You have lots of like NATO training, stuff like that going on. So this is again, something that is consistently in the forefront of people's minds that like a national security thing, especially if you do see like NATO forces in your country because you know your country's weak on your own, you do have the constant fear that something might happen and you're actually in danger. So that's the way to like play up the stuff about people are afraid. The second aspect of it is that the likelihood of aggression is why Russia actually would ever do something. Several reasons under this. One, it is the historic goal of the Russian empire to actually control all of the areas they did have under their uh, like under their control during the Soviet Union times, uh, under the eyes of the Russian population, the way like Putin also to some extent kind of like justifies its rule or like gets at least some type of legitimacy uh, and like why the expansionist policies that Russia does are things that are supported is that people tend to support it because they do kind of feel like they have um, a historic control over like the Baltic states or like Eastern Europe, because that's just how like Tsar, the Tsar's Russia used to be like, and all of the Eastern European countries were under the control of like imperialist Russia. That's one thing. The second thing is that just the expansionist policy is something that like Putin uses as justification to stay in power, but that's probably like the same thing as the first one. Uh, thirdly, uh, what Putin often does is that they use the liberation of Russian minority groups as an, as an excuse or a reason why to be hostile against Eastern European countries. So what this means is that um, especially all of the Baltic states, but generally Eastern European countries have a large ethnic minority population uh, of ethnic Russians, uh, i.e. in Estonia, it's 30% of the population is actually ethnic Russian. Uh, 
Um, oftentimes they live in like very segregated conditions. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Uh, but then what Putin does and has like quite openly said in like interviews, so this is like not just making it up as a fact for the debate, but that's just the genuine legitimate reasoning that has in the past been used or was also used as a justification for Russia invading Crimea being like, look, we're going to liberate the people who actually want to be part of Russia. They're like, look, we're just taking care of our population. The fact that they're there uh, is a problem we need to fix. So that's another reason that is used. Uh, lastly, just economic. Russia is generally like in an economically problematic situation. They need economic control um, over uh, over like types of resources. They want access to the sea, stuff like that. It would just be economically beneficial. I would just note that this here is not to say that it's very likely that Russia is going to invade the Baltic states soon. I think that this is just analysis you can use in the debate to play up that this is a very important threat and an important point that people worry about. And at that point, it becomes important in relationships to like Europe and in a relationships that people have within, like among each other. Uh, but also the fact that you have evidence from things like Russia invading Georgia, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, it is also not a far-fetched possibility. Uh, oh, and last thing under this is that uh, Russia just generally wants to get closer to the EU and the US in the sense of like, one economic benefits but also to the like rivalry between russia and the us and like election meddling and all of that type of stuff uh russia wants control over it because he wants a wants favorable presidents and leaders to be in those countries the way this like works in terms of like the analysis you're able to do it uh is basically in most of those debates um the policies and the stuff you talk over, I, it's like the stuff of like, oh, should US be in, uh, antagonistic or diplomatic with Russia? Or should the NATO have enhanced forward presence within Eastern Europe? Uh, stuff like that. The main clash that happens in those types of debates is that whether you're antagonizing Russia with this policy or you're containing Russia with this policy. Um, and I feel like this is the thing that also kind of responds to the question that I got in the chat on like what's the benefit of Russia to Eastern Europe, because like some of the stuff here is like what is the interest of Eastern Europe. So the first thing is enhanced forward presence, what this means, because this might be super a spec term and I just know it because I live in Estonia. But what this means is that it's a NATO policy after Russia invaded Ukraine that uh, NATO forces are now constantly going to be present in Eastern European countries, notably the Baltic states, uh, in order to like train forces, but to some extent also like deter Russia uh, from ever invading because NATO is there. Uh, and in case Russia ever decides to do anything or be antagonistic, uh, then you have a NATO force always ready to um, act in a situation of need. So that's basically the like what this is. The way this like plays out in debates uh, is that, and I think that it doesn't have to be necessarily just the very specific policy of enhanced forward presence, but it's any type of like, uh, should like how, what should the policy of the US be towards Russia? Is like the one clash with that is the deterrence point and the feeling of safety. Um, what this means is the stuff if you know that uh, if Russia knows that NATO forces are within all of those Eastern European or Baltic states. Uh, then Russia has a higher deterrence from actually ever invading because if on the comparative you just have like Estonian conscript military that is really weak and has like 10 people in it and Russia has millions and millions of like soldiers, then obviously it is an easier calculation for Russia to invade versus when you have lots of NATO soldiers, which also shows the commitment that other NATO soldiers in the future would come in if Russia ever did something, it acts like a deterrence from Russia, for Russia to ever do anything in terms of like Eastern European countries. The second like benefit of this types of things is the feeling of safety people get. If you are um, an Eastern European person, you know that your country is bordering Russia. You just generally get a feeling of safety if you know that like NATO is actually committing to its promise and showing that it cares about your country because it has sent soldiers and sent forces and stuff like that. They're con continuously present there. If ever anything happened, you know you're like in safe hands. The flip side of that, and the way in which it actually might be like possibly more true, there's lots of analysis and this type of thing, if you ever want to like Google it or watch debates on it, uh, is that one of the reactions to enhance forward presence by Russia is that it, because the way Putin presents himself as a strong man or as a person that cannot like be fucked with, then he, when he's being provoked by the fact that you have NATO forces right on his border, 
then he is much more likely to put more money into the military. He responds with like bringing more forces onto uh, onto the borders, getting them like militarily ready. Obviously, not taking any specific military action, but even having like very um, like public, for example, military training operations on the borders of the Baltic states is something that actually just makes Russia more angry, makes it act more hostile, possibly even like conducting some missions uh, or I don't know, having higher meddling in affairs or doing like, I don't know, cyber attacks and stuff like that is a harm that actually might come from the fact that you have angered Russia and Russia needs to prove that it's stronger than the NATO uh, and it's stronger and it's it cannot just be like pushed back um, just by having some like more forces there so it acts, acts like uh there's like the flip side to this and i think that that's the uh if, if the question is like ah oh, how is like what is the relation of eastern europeans uh, eastern europe and russia then in that case you always have the interest of not antagonizing russia in that sense uh, in order to not get any more like security attacks on you the second policy that is done in terms of national security is sanctions i think that like Obviously, in, in ever if you ever have any like sanctions debates, um, you can use like more like the stocky analysis and sanctions on whether they work or not. I think that there are great examples of those debates available on YouTube that you can uh, like you can go and watch and see how great debaters do the type of analysis. To make it quite specific to Eastern Europe, is that I think on one side, uh, the one side claims that sanctions generally have a limited impact, i.e. when, or, or for example, when Russia invaded Ukraine or Crimea and Donbass area uh, in 2014, uh, after that, when like European countries, I think also the US, uh, sanctioned the Russia, uh, it basically had absolutely no impact. Russia is still present in those areas. It is like Crimea and that those types of areas are not part uh, of Ukraine, uh, they're still Russian controlled. So like the aggression that Russia did basically received no, uh, even if there was some like backlash to it in the sense of like having sanctions, uh, then that had very limited impact on actually ever changing anything in the course of action that Russia took. You still had the military conflict there. It is still under Russian control. Unclear if it has many like strong impacts on it. The like the, uh the flip side of that is that one if you do things like sanctioning that is something that gives a very strong signaling effect to the rest of europe of being like look we do care about these issues and i think it's quite important in terms of eastern europe especially if you have characterized the stuff about uh why a sense of security or why the feeling of safety is something that is present in people's minds why they care about it why they're afraid of russia even if the sanctions actually do nothing then the fact that the eu is very willing to sanction russia over some things is something that shows um, quite clearly, like the support of the European Union towards Eastern Europe, uh, and I think that's an, like an important impact you can bring. Uh, and the second stuff about sanctions is that Russian economy is quite weak. Uh, there are like separate reasons for it, um, but like things like the COVID pandemic, less possibility of getting money from oil, general sanctions against it have made it quite weak. If you're continuing to sanction it, it does actually have an impact in Russia, so you can do some type of impacting there. Um, but obviously, there are like other claims as well in terms of like how sanctions might actually empower Russia or like create more narratives about things like, ah, oh, the West is against us and West hates us and you know, all of the people need to hate the West back, stuff like that. So it, it has quite a lot of clashes in there as to why it's a good or a bad thing. Uh, but these are the more Eastern European aspects. Lastly, economic cooperation, and this is mostly based on the motion of Nord Stream 2, uh, just to give a recap of what this motion means is that uh, Germany, uh, there's like a direct oil pipeline going from Russia to Germany, uh, basically where just Russia sells its oil through that. And the question is whether it's like a good or a bad thing. Um, and that's like an example of economic cooperation. I think um, in addition to that like very specific pipeline, all of the other types of economic cooperation with Russia also exist. Like, I don't know, Eastern European countries actually do trade with like Russia quite a lot in the sense of like, they buy oil from Russia. They also like, I think, sell like agricultural products to Russia, if I'm not mistaken. So that type of trade happens. What this means is that not only do Eastern European countries get some monetary benefit from it, uh, but the second thing of any type of economic cooperation that you have with Russia creates an incentive for Russia to meddle less with, uh, with like the affairs of those countries. What this means is that if Russia is super reliant on the, uh, on the European economy, uh, whether in the sense that everyone is buying oil, whether you're sending a pipeline to uh, to Germany and you want the German market to be super stable, you want the European Union, the euro, 
all of that to be super stable, then obviously Russia is not going to invade one of the European countries because that would create massive economic chaos and Russia itself would lose out significantly economically from that. Uh, it can be made more nuanced with things like how like the Russian oligarchs or the people who are supporting Putin are themselves investing a lot in like European markets, uh, like buying companies, having companies there generally. That is something that again, creates an incentive for Putin to not meddle too much with Russia, uh, meddle too much with Eastern Europe specifically, because that would ruin, uh, due to the integration of the market, that would generally ruin the possibilities of Russia to earn lots of money from it. So the economic cooperation to some extent is actually really beneficial for Eastern European countries uh, to maintain better stability. There obviously is also the flip side of this is that it gives economic and political support or like signaling support to Putin that you're fine to trade with this kind of a country uh, that Putin can actually earn money from this type of an venture, uh, which obviously can be characterized as a harm and stuff like that. Uh, but I think that's the like other point of it. And I think the signaling effect is something that is quite important, especially if you look at the like direct gas pipeline to uh, to Germany, the Nord Stream motion, then especially under that, if you are, if the European Union, for example, is, is supporting economic policies that are more beneficial for Central Europe rather than Eastern Europe, then what happens is that they are giving Russia like closer, like bringing Russia closer and not sanctioning the regime that could actually just hurt uh, all of those Eastern European states that again, seems like something of like a betrayal uh, for Eastern European countries. Uh, the way to impact this is, I think, one, uh, in terms of like the sense of security people have, the likelihood of aggression that ever might come. So all of those types of things, uh, you do need to kind of do the thing of like, one, whether actually, if you have, for example, enhanced forward presence, or if you have things like sanctions, is it going to anger Russia more? Is it going to bring Russia out and make do more things? Uh, but even if the like, real likelihood of actual war happening is low, you can still impact it to things like a sense of security that you have within Europe for Eastern European countries, whether you feel safe or not. I think that the way you can like continue that on is again to your skepticism, all of the stuff I talked about in the beginning about like national security and how that's a big concern at a point at which you feel like the European Union is not caring about your national security concerns. That is something that again feeds into the Euro skepticism narrative and all of the impacts I brought from there are also applicable in this case, if you're able to do this like quite detailed analysis about national security. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, I hope that this is clear. If you have any questions about national security and stuff like that, uh, feel free to interrupt me here or put them in the chat. If not, I will move on to, I think my last large point. Uh, which is uh, identity. Uh, I think this comes up probably the least out of all of the things that I talked about, but I thought that this would be interesting to include because some of the, because most of the stuff I'm going to talk here is like broadly characterizing Eastern European states in terms of like identity. Uh, it might also be useful in all of the other debates or in making your analysis more persuasive or giving you ways in which you're able to, for example, bring examples because you know some of the more context of it. But the example, uh, the motions in which you could technically use this analysis from uh, is uh, the first one is very specifically about identity. This house believes that states formerly under the rule of the Soviet Union should not emphasize their history of struggle against Russian imperialism in constructing their national identity, which is just a very specific identity clash and how it interacts with like Russia, European Union, and all of those types of things. And the second motion is more about the internal politics of Eastern European countries. This house believes that leftist parties in Eastern Europe should prioritize left economic policies and, uh, and postulates over progressive liberty rights, um, which is a clash again that plays onto the identity question of individual people uh, and how people perceive themselves and have their identity constructed within Eastern Europe. I hope that's clear. So the pieces of important characterization uh, here are quite a couple. The first thing, uh, and like, I'm, I would just gonna promise this with saying that like not all of this analysis would fit under both of the motions, you just, uh, or like in either of them technically. Uh, so this is just something that might be useful in different scenarios. So first important characterization point is to note something about the population. I think I already mentioned it, but there is a large ethnic Russian minority group uh, in each of the Eastern European states. 
And but the problem with those uh, those ethnic groups is that there is quite a high segregation um, between like the other ethnic groups, like ethnic Estonians and Latvians, for example. What this means is that they're oftentimes very congregated in specific areas of the country, oftentimes closer to the Russian border. They're not living in the same areas, and there isn't always a strong interaction between them. The language is another issue in terms of the type of education you get. Um, it is a very much a contentious issue. And I think all of the Baltic countries on like whether um, ethnic Russian minorities should be able to study uh, in like middle and primary school in their own language, i.e. in Russian, or should they fully just only study in Estonian? I think that that is a very important political issue in all of those countries. And again, always pops up in all elections. Uh, so that just shows how that is a very divisive issue uh, within those countries. Also, oftentimes, the youth of ethnic, like, for example, Estonian people do not speak Russian. The ethnic Russian youth do not speak Estonian. So there's also no way of these people ever interacting with each other. That, again, creates problems of further, like, uh, oftentimes the more ethnic Russian groups are uh, more impoverished because they have less work or like study opportunities because they don't know the language. It's all like these accumulating problems over on top of each other uh, due to the fact of like this like type of segregation happening. The second important aspect under the population is that also oftentimes these uh, these more ethnic minority groups, uh, ethnic Russian groups, but also some people who are just like ethnically Estonian but are more pro-Russian are in Russian infosphere. They watch Russian national media, which because it's controlled by Putin, it's just basically full of lots of propaganda. Um, in that sense, what this means is that lots of the people do generally just buy into the narrative of what whatever Russia is propagating to them. This is also another issue that was, for example, seen uh, within like COVID vaccines, lots of the Russian speaking populations of those countries didn't get vaccinated just because they didn't consume any Estonian media and there wasn't any information available to them in like properly in Russian. Uh, and the Russian media just propagated that like COVID is a hoax and you shouldn't get vaccinated and stuff like that. So that's like, these are like actual problems that happen within those societies when you're in the Russian infosphere. It will later become also important when you're like characterizing politics. Uh, the second important piece of characterization is that most in Eastern European countries are super anti-communist, uh, which is something that is just a legacy of the Soviet Union. They remember that you have uh, like any policy that can even vaguely be labeled communist is something they have lots of opposition to because you just generally have bad memories from the Soviet Union. You were economically bad off. And you had nothing on the on the store shelves, uh, stuff like that. People just have bad memories from it. And that creates a very strong anti-communist sentiment. Thirdly, people have a sense of victimhood uh, genuinely just because of the, the history of the Soviet Union uh, in the sense that most families have people that were like, I don't know, taken to concentration camps, taken to be killed or were just like kidnapped from them or taken away by the secret police or the KGB. So people just have very direct context and very dark memory of it from the communist times of like very strong collective trauma from it. Uh, and this is also propagated again through things like memorials for the victims of communism, which again demonizes the nature of communism and is like, look, this is something that has create, create and created victims within, uh, within our society. Fourthly, there is generally a political demonization of communism. I think that it's quite clear where it comes from like here from the previous reasons of how people generally feel about it and why that is something that is supported. This is something that was evident in the policy of lustration, which is um, basically just uh, after the Soviet Union, lots of the Eastern European countries purged their political structures of all of the people who were vaguely even connected to communism in some senses, or who had at least some connections to previous regimes or did some like bad things. And they just got rid of them entirely uh, to kind of start from a new clean state. So it's just a very strong anti any of that history sentiment that you have, uh, but also being communist uh, generally, or like if a political opponent calls you communist or calls you out and being too communist or having policies like that, that is something that is basically like a political death for you, like not obviously all the time and sometimes it's just like mudslinging, but this is just generally like the, the type of discourse that you are able to see. What this means in terms of the impacting, before I do that, I'm just gonna point out what the map on the right here is, is that basically it's a map of where the ethnic uh, Russian minorities live within the Baltic states. Uh, and I think that what it shows is that you have quite a clear difference 
uh, in terms of in which areas they live in, i.e. you have quite a strong segregation, like in some of the more easternmost areas, you have a lot more of them versus compared to like uh, other areas, you have a lot less of them. So that just is here to like show the uh, segregation aspect. Uh, what is the red mark, red water is indicating? What the, uh, red the red line is the, so the topmost country is Estonia, then below the second red line uh, or the first red line is Latvia and then the last red line is Lithuania. So it's just country borders. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, okay, first impact on politics. Uh, so I think the stuff about like the communism, what this leads to is that there is a general strong opposition to social welfare policies. Anything that's like, I don't know, like uh, having progressive tax systems is relatively like in the very straightforward sense, you would expect it to be like in, for example, in the Nordic countries, that is something that is very much less evident in Eastern European countries. For example, Czech Republic just genuinely has no progressive tax system, stuff like that. You just have a very, very strong opposition to those types of things. Uh, there is a support for like neoliberalism. People do favor things like private property quite a lot. Uh, like most of the countries, like even you have like public health care systems, you always have a private health care compared to that. It's very common that people go to like private health providers in addition to like the public system existing. So that's the type of like political sentiment that exists. Uh, I think an important point to note here is that obviously I'm generalizing, obviously not all people there are like that, uh, but it's just the general trend of the way political parties in power are doing politics. Obviously there is a trend in the youth that are more socialists that are more progressive that are more liberal uh but that's just how it has generally been in the past like 10 20 years and how it kind of actually still is. hello uh, yeah yeah just i was what do you feel yourself just i was new uh and what, sorry what about the geopolitics geopolitics uh geopolitics uh i feel like the national uh, security part to some extent cover that or like do you mean how the how that is impacted in terms yeah. of uh, the identity yeah. stuff? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the identity stuff. Uh, I will talk about that in like three points I think uh, so I'll definitely come back to that. Okay. So impacts on identity uh, is that one I think it's actually quite common to have things like patriotism and nationalism that to some extent are normalized things like independence days uh, are very much celebrated like in a large manner. I feel like if there is more, like, I don't know, like in the UK, you don't uh, like, like British patriotism is oftentimes seen relatively badly, I think by like white British people, uh, because it seems like imperialist and stuff like that. I think the general, the existence of patriotism in Baltic states is not oftentimes seen quite nearly as badly because of the sense of like we previously had victimhood all of that what the result of that is is that you do have quite strong like nationalist and also like very strong conservative right-wing politicians also getting getting to power just campaigning on that type of a thing uh, i think that also kind of overlaps a bit with the euro skepticism like you don't like the european identity you have your own stuff uh what this also means is that it has a strong support for the like the independent nation state uh the stuff i talked about like the migration crisis previously is that just there's quite a lot of racism uh but not only to just towards like like racism against black people but like literally anyone else who's not from your nationality who isn't like a white estonian um uh, you do have like quite a just it's a very common thing to be quite racist about it or like not be, be very much anti-refugees or uh, have just like a strong opposition of having any type of people coming into your country or like anti-migration uh, obviously, again, this is not something that everyone in Estonia believes in, but it's just something that the more conservative political parties are quite easily able to campaign on. Uh, and that's, for example, why the reason the Estonian Conservative Party has like 20 to 30 percent popular support, which is actually quite a significant percentage. Uh, but also like the even the like more centrist uh, governments also have like relatively strict uh, immigration policy. So that's something that another way it like manifests itself. Thirdly, impacts on relations with Russia, which I think also responds to the question to some extent. I think that the first thing of the like the segregation stuff, uh, why I talked about it quite extensively and why the map is here, is that the evidence of the like bad treatment of Russian minorities is something that Putin actually does use an excuse for intervention, like I mentioned before. So that is something that is um, one impact of it. The second thing is, 
is that you generally have a strong demand for the European Union and generally West countries like the US to have a hostile approach to Russia to for you to like be legitimized in your uh, in your identity construction, the fact that you were previously wronged by Russia, all of the like the historic sentiments, you do have kind of a hostile approach to it. But I think here is an important caveat to make. Because you have so many uh, ethnic Russian minorities, you also have lots of politicians catering to those Russian minorities. So having like pro-Russian uh, like Kremlin puppets as politicians in Eastern European countries is really not that uncommon at all. Um, and I think they're also in countries like Hungary, uh, being pro-Russian, like even like publicly, isn't seen as as much of a bad thing as it is seen, for example, in the Baltic states. So I think that like that is again, it's, um, it shows the type of division you have within Eastern European countries, because like Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania are a lot more hostile and anti-Russia uh, due to the way in which the, those countries were annexed by Russia historically. Hungary has that a lot less. Uh, but in all of those countries, you do have at least some politicians uh, who are pro-Russian just to appeal to the Russian minorities who are generally living in the Russian infosphere, uh, who just share the type of history, uh, all of that. Uh, I think that this is generally the, I think the like substantive part of what I wanted to present to you. I don't think I have any more.